The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. And today is one of those rare occurrences where our new book review is the number one bestseller this week. There's, it's already been a PBS special. People are writing about this book. Um, I've seen the author in a lot of shows. So it seems to be a topic. And we have a very, this is one of the largest crowds we've had in a while. So Danielle Holly, she's um, an adjunct down at the Bioethics Institute at Albany Med. And she's also a lawyer at O'Connell and Aronowitz. And the end of care life, of course, involves legal and ethical issues. So we have the perfect speaker. So here's Danielle Holly. Thanks, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, a little bit of my background, I, I went to law school and I also did the bioethics program. And after I graduated, I did an ethics fellowship at Albany Med. So I went on rounds and I saw a lot of things that we talked about in the book. Um, and then I went to practice law full time. Uh, speak a little loud. Absolutely, sorry. I don't have a booming voice, so I'll make sure to speak loudly. Uh, I, th I think this is a great book and it's not your typical book. I'm assuming some of you have read it here and the book was really powerful, and I think it boils down to two main issues. Uh, it discusses autonomy, both in the non-medical setting about choosing to live at home and the ability to do such, particularly when our society has created this um, continuum of care and this belief in the nursing home system. And then also about the medical choices and how physicians and the rest of us are equipped in deciding about those issues. He starts at the beginning of the book, and I think this was one of the best quotes that summarizes a lot of the things. It says, it is not death that the very old tell me they fear. It is what happens short of death. As Felix put it to me, old age is a continuous series of losses. And we saw that throughout the book. So the first issue we see is the non-medical confrontation of not being able to live at home, how to deal with that, and losing the autonomy and the choice. So you see the tension between the generations. So there's the story about Lou. He was the one who lived outside of Boston, wanted to play cribbage and hang out at his house, and slowly the falls in his medical condition his family and doctors started having concerns about him being able to continue to stay at his home by himself. And so there, he moved in with his family and you, you hear the whole story about his daughter and her ability to take care of him and the feelings that were associated with that as well as with um, the children. And so she wanted to move him to a nursing home, which she felt guilty about. He didn't want to go. He eventually went to an assisted living, didn't like it. They worked out a compromise. He lived there half time, lived at her house half time. There's still a lot of issues. And then you slowly see as the book progresses the story about Lou and finding the new home uh, that was based off the Sanborn Place in Oregon, but was in Boston, about a like smaller facility that wasn't designed like your typical nursing home and had that home-like feeling. And that was key that everyone kept talking about throughout the book that Atul saw with everyone, that they, everyone wanted this home-like feeling. And he discussed for the first half of the book the lack of foundation to stay at home. So he talked about how we shifted in society to focusing on health and safety. So in New York, there are so many regulations regarding um, staying at home, nursing homes, safe discharges from hospitals. When I used to do rounds at the hospital, one of the biggest issues was a safe discharge. So there are rules and regulations from both federal and state regarding that that make it really hard for people leaving the hospital who don't have the support at home and maybe need some rehab to go straight home. And then there are limits on you know, what services can be provided at home and 
the services, you still need someone there. You still have to have a secondary person. So if you don't have anyone and if you're not living and your family has spread out, particularly as our generations um, and as the decades have passed, we don't necessarily live near the rest of our family. I'm a prime example. All my family is down south and I'm the sole person up here up north. You know, and it makes a big difference when you're talking about these issues because now people are spread far apart. You may not have that at least family group to rely upon to help. So what do you do? And there's these concerns about safe discharge and what to do. So there's now all these regulations about what you have to have and who needs to be there and how many people and how many hours. And you end up being sometimes people feel that, particularly doctors, feel the need that you need to go to a nursing home. And so he talks about that and how, as society, we don't know what to do. We don't want to talk about it, and we are concerned about the health and safety. And I think the story of Lou is key in that. So Lou's daughter was so concerned about his safety and about him falling all the time and not being able to be on his own. He was concerned about losing his autonomy and just wanting to be at home. So you see the tension between the generations, and as the story progresses, you slowly see finding a place that satisfied both needs. He was safe, he had nurses and aides and family and friends around, but he also had the autonomy and he had his own room and he was able to bring his own things and he had, you know, was able to have pets and all of that. Um, so you see this kind of thing that we don't normally see in the society that we have is not really ready and doesn't have all these resources all the time structured because we have such a focus on health and safety. The other great uh, piece in the book that talks about this issue about the non-medical confrontation about not being able to be at home and losing autonomy is the issue about the New Berlin experiment, which I thought was hilarious. It was the nursing home out in New Berlin and they decided to bring in you know, four dogs and four cats and a hundred parakeets. And the nursing staff and the whole administration was like, I don't know how we're gonna do this. How, how are we gonna do this? And he's like, nope, trust me, we're gonna do it. We're just gonna bring everyone from the farm in and we're gonna bring all the parakeets. And I think one of the funniest things that was making me chuckle was the parakeets came in, but they didn't have the bird cages yet. So they put them in the hair salon and just stuck them in the room and shut the doors and the people dropping off the parakeets ran. So then you had 100 birds flying around the hair salon, not able to be put anywhere until the cages came. And then the cages came later that day and they weren't put together. So then it was trying to put together all of the cages for the parakeets and then herding the parakeets into all the cages and putting them out throughout the, the nursing home. It, and the guy who, uh, the administrator who came to run New Berlin was unfazed. He was so excited about this and he said that everyone was having a good laugh but it was totally unexpected. And he was challenging the norm of what we expect to have in nursing homes and what we expect to have uh, you know, with services and the focus not on necessarily on health and safety because people were so concerned about the bird droppings and the cat litter and he, he was concerned about the quality of life and what makes people happy and this well-being as we age. Uh, and he makes a great insight. He says in the book, medicine's focus is narrow. Medical professionals concentrate on repair of health, not sustenance of the soul. And he talks about this paradox. We go to the doctor and we want everything fixed. We say, fix now, just do this, fix this, I just need something, and the doctors are, are trained. That's what they go to medical school for. Many of them want to be able to fix something, and they have this desire just to fix, 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 not necessarily thinking about the whole picture or what this is all about. And he said that using medicine to treat the trials of sickness, aging, and mortality as medical concerns is what we've been focused on, not dealing with it as the aging and well-being and the shift in preferences that happens as we age. So then the second half of the book talks about the medical decisions of what treatments to have when the default is to do this fix, 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 and to always push forward and not really think about it and just go to the default 
of yes to everything, yes to the experimental drug, yes to the surgery, yes to the chemo, yes to four rounds of chemo, and even though the statistics show that that fourth round's not going to help, that we just default to pushing forward, not really thinking about what our preferences are and what we actually want. The story that, that hit me most and you know that he spends a lot of time on was Sarah. Uh, she was age 34, she was pregnant. She was 39 weeks pregnant and she found out she had cancer. So the focus then was what do we do? Well, you know, immediately all the oncologists and the surgeons got together and said, okay, we can do this treatment and this treatment and we'll induce labor, we'll have you have your baby early, baby will go to the NICU, and then we will put you through all these rounds of things. We'll do this surgery and then we'll do this round of chemo. And uh, in the book it talks about all of that and no doctor wanted to confront that her lung cancer, despite not being a non-smoker, she got lung cancer, that it was fatal, and that she didn't have a very good chance of surviving regardless of chemo. No one wanted to talk about it. And Dr. Gwande even became her consulting surgeon for parts of it when her cancer spread outside of her lungs. And he said that he didn't even, wasn't willing to face reality. And he found himself telling her that, oh, there's these unrealistic hopes that she'll be able to beat this and maybe the experimental drug will t you know, treat the lung cancer and the thyroid cancer even though he knew in his heart and his medical training that that just wasn't going to happen but he found himself saying this because he wasn't ready to face telling her about her prognosis. It's talked about in the front line which I recommend everyone watching. It's, he talks um, through a lot of the stories he puts in his book in an hour-long episode on Frontline. And he goes in Frontline a couple years after Sarah passed away, and he goes and talks to her husband. And the husband talks about how, you know, they were so focused on lengthening the long time with all these hopes that the you know chemotherapy treatment would extend life for 10 to 20 years, that they forgot to focus on the short time she had and that everyone was really worried about focusing on such a long term that they forgot to look at what's happening now. And she wasn't able to hold her baby. She got so weak from chemo, she couldn't even hold her baby. And Dr. Tool talks about how um, he wishes he had have handled it differently and how he wishes he had have been more upfront and less optimistic and just had faced the reality and had a different conversation. So for him, he looks back throughout the book and the Frontline series of how could he handle this differently and how could he have conversation differently. So there's another patient that he sees uh, named uh, Miss Douglas who's in her 60s and has cancer in her stomach. And it's just growing and growing and growing and he's consulted as a surgeon to see what he can do for her. And she knows it's bad, and, but she's not ready to admit it, and her family's not ready to admit it. And he approaches Ms. Douglas completely differently. He says, what are your preferences? What are your worst fears? What is it that you want to accomplish? Changing the focus of the conversation instead of just providing all of this information and defaulting to the treat everything, he said, I learned from Sarah I need to focus on what it is that the person wants and what it is that I can help them accomplish for their quality of life without necessarily always fixing something. Medicine sometimes, he says, has gone too far and we forget that we can always tinker with something. Doctors, as doctors, we can always tinker and keep tinkering without necessarily providing the benefit that our patients want. So he stopped short and asked. And Ms. Douglas talked about how she had set up her friends on a date and she wanted to go to their wedding and she wanted to go see her grandchild. And he said, okay, let's, you know, I can do a surgery that, you know, isn't full blown, but we'll do part of this and we can make, you know, things better for you. And she said, okay, no risky chances. 
he goes, okay, I understand, no risky chances, we'll go in and we'll just see what we can do to help. So he starts the surgery and he realizes that it's a lot worse than he anticipated. So he stops and only does a little bit, you know, he puts in some tubes to help relieve her pain. And she comes out and she says, thank you, you know, for not taking the risky chance. And she was able to go home and do the things she wanted to do. And she thanked him for understanding and taking the time to have that conversation. To have that conversation about what it is that she wanted instead of just throwing information about every next treatment you can have. So he goes on to talk about physician and patient relationships. And for a long time, we always saw the paternalistic physician-patient relationship. There's a lot of articles written about this of how, you know, early in the 19th century, 20th century, we saw that we just deferred to the physician. Whatever they said, we did. We didn't get a lot of information. We didn't really have an active role in medicine. We just went with what the doctor said and, you know, the doctor knows best. And that's how we did it. So then there was a major shift you know, in the 1960s, 1970s, when we really started shifting toward um, patient autonomy and the issues of informed consent. And there was almost a shift to the other end of the pendulum where doctors just became in this information mode. And that's the error that Dr. Gawande trained in, is that you just provide all of the information to the patient, you don't guide them, and they just expect them to understand the complexity and to make decisions. And that you know the doctor isn't there to guide them, but to just, hey, here's all the information, here's the five types of chemo you can have, you make the decision. And he said that we swung too far you know, that way, and that the best model that we really should embrace is the physician-patient relationship that he calls inferential. So that is, you know, he talks about the goals and the treatment desires and life goals of the patient and then says, okay, we have treatment A, you know, treatment B, or, you know, as he calls it, the red pill and the blue pill. And after talking to the patient can say, okay, if you want to meet you know, these goals, like I want to go to Florida and I want to see my son get married. Okay, we can do that if we take this and tailoring the treatment based upon a discussion of the patient. And he acknowledges that that is tough. Not very many physicians do this and that it is a growing trend that needs to be addressed. And I think that's exactly right. You know, we see so many times when I used to do ethics consults that the biggest issue was that the physician was just in information mode, maybe not taking time to consider all of the preferences and the family dynamic that's there. And the family wasn't ready to admit, the patient wasn't ready to admit like what was going on, didn't know, wasn't willing to have a discussion with their own family about what it is that's going on and what is their preference, you know, not wanting to upset anyone. And they were at a loss. They just had all this medical information without a clue of how to accomplish their goals with what information was provided to them with just, you know, bunches of options of medical treatment. And so, you know, I used to get called in as ethics consults to be able to help do the communication barrier, as I called it. You know, having those conversations and just translating the medical into the daily preferences of what is best for the patient, what they want, and understanding how we can accomplish their goals with the medical treatment that's available. And Dr. Gwande talks about that and how we need to focus on that and shift our perception into having the shared role, understanding that maybe not doing the surgery or doing the chemotherapy is not the answer, that rather the answer is doing something else that will help the patient achieve whatever goal they want, whether it's short term or long term, and discussing those issues based upon you know, the goals and treatment outcomes that the patient wants, instead of just saying, okay, we're gonna treat and we're gonna take the most aggressive treatment. I think the other big thing he talks about is that doctors are unprepared to talk about the end of life is the person dying and can't answer that question. 
he talks about a patient who specifically asked her oncologist, am I dying? And the oncologist switched the subject, wasn't able to answer it, and just wasn't able to confront the own mortality of that issue. And there's statistics and studies showing that Dr. Gwande talks about that the better the relationship sometimes between the patient and the physician, if it's been a long treatment time and the physician and patient have become friendly, that it's often harder for the physician to accurately assess the outcomes and to tell the patient and confront that mortality issue and the well-being of the patient. In fact, uh, he gives quotes which I just think are amazing, that there was this study done by uh, Nicholas, whose last name I'm not going to try to pronounce, but uh, it says that 63% of doctors overestimated their patient's survival time when they had that relationship, and just 17% underestimated it. The average estimate was 530% too high. 530% too high. I mean, I don't know about you, but that that's really high <laughs> and unrealistic. I mean, might as well not ask at that point if uh, we're talking about 530% too high. And he goes on to say that the better the doctors knew their patients, the, the more likely they were to err. That it was so hard for the physician to confront the issue, despite all the medical training and all that knowledge, the personal feelings and the ability to have that conversation with someone that they had come to care for was just too hard. He said, and this is a great quote, he's a second, we often avoid voicing even these sentiments. Studies find that although doctors usually tell patients when a cancer is not curable, most are reluctant to give a specific prognosis, even when pressed. More than 40% of oncologists admit to offering treatments that they believe are unlikely to work. So I mean, Dr. Gwande talks about it with Sarah, the young girl, or lady, I should say, who's 34. You know, she went through multiple rounds of chemo that everyone knew probably didn't have the benefit of treating her in the long term, but they just couldn't stop treating, that they had to do everything they could. We also saw it with Doc, Mrs. Douglas, who was in her 60s. Just the oncologists were not ready to admit. They said, let's just keep treating. And we also see it with Dr. Gawande's own father that he talks about in the book. So Dr. Gawande's father and mother were both physicians. They lived in Ohio. Dr. Gawande's father ends up getting diagnosed with a cancer growing in a spinal canal. He ignored it for years and eventually found out that he had it. And it became so bad that he started having tremors and he could no longer practice surgery. Then it talks about how he shifted his priorities and wanted to play tennis and give back to the community. And eventually it became so bad that he was becoming a quadriplegic. He lost feeling in the arms and legs and couldn't walk. And the book talks about how even though there are three physicians with over 120 years of experience, they themselves couldn't have the conversation. They weren't ready, and they were uh, just trying the next thing. And it's a really touching story. And Dr. Gwandi talks about how, as things became worse for his father, his father started to realize it, but his mother was just not ready to let go, was not ready to acknowledge that you know, it's okay that, you know, his, his, her husband was not wanting to have all these aggressive treatments. But he did some. He went and had this radiation, whole brain radiation, a um, spinal surgery where they opened up his spine so the cancer could grow out instead of compressing on the nerves. And he went through all this and it made him worse. Then the doctors were talking about more chemotherapy and more radiation, and he said, no, I'm not doing it. I'm just not doing it. I want to go home. And he went home, and he was able to get services at home. And his community had just started a group called the Athens Group, where they had, you know, for a flat fee, people could join the group, and they would employ people in the community to help out 
um, older individuals who still lived at home. So they hired a mechanic who could come and fix everything that at one time you were able to fix and no longer could you deal with the hot water heater blowing up or you know the, the leaky faucet. And that you know we have other people drop Meals on Wheels by or casseroles and just were there for assistance and aid. And so he joined that group to kind of become part of this community so that he could stay at home and get additional aid. But one day he fell out of bed and couldn't get up and his wife couldn't pick him up. And then she, because she had arthritis, she couldn't get up. She got on the floor and then she couldn't get up. <laughs> so they're both laying on the floor, stuck on the floor, until the housekeeper comes and finds them both and was able to help them up. The mom calls Dr. Gwande frantically saying, you know, your father had this event. He's on the floor. I couldn't get up. I got stuck on the floor. Come help. And so he flies out of Boston to go see them. He tells the story about by the end of the night, his parents were laughing about the fact that they were both stuck on the floor or calling it a romantic evening for themselves. But he, at that point, acknowledges that it's much harder and that things were getting worse for his dad and no one was really ready to have this conversation. So he used the lessons he learned from Sarah and his other patients and started having conversations about what is it, dad, that you want to do and what are, what are you fearful of and what are your most concerns? And his dad said, I don't want to be a burden to my family. I want to be able to still be independent and I don't want to go to the hospital. I want to be home. So they start talking about it, and he brings up hospice, and the mom says, absolutely not, not ready for that, not talking about it, we're not doing that. And his dad goes, nope, we're doing that. And you see the shift, despite you know all of them being doctors, that it's just this really, really hard conversation to have. And the hospice nurse comes. And Dr. Gwande says, unfair, you know, he goes, I unfairly treated her. I thought, you know, we were out in this rural country town. The, the hospice nurse could not be like anything I saw in Boston. So he was very skeptical. And she comes and she puts all three of the doctors quiet and take, addresses all their concerns. She comes in and says, how are you feeling today, Dr. Gwande? You know, how, what are your concerns? What, it is, what is it that I can do? You know, and then she starts on the hard conversation. Have you discussed a DNR? Have you discussed about calling the hospital? And Atul Gwande, the author of the book, tr says that it was so tough. And at one point, the hospice nurse turned to his mom and says, I know you're not going to like to hear this, but as things progress, you need to call the hospice line. And you need not to call the hospital, because that's what your husband just chose. And he said his mom just looked blankly, not ready to accept this conversation. But he said it was a great conversation. His father actually said, here are all my decisions. Here's what I want. I don't want to go to the hospital. I want to stay home. I don't want to be in pain. And it's most important that I can type on the computer and uh, Skype because he had family still in India and he wanted to see his grandchildren that lived in Boston. So that's what everyone worked toward. And he talks about how his dad, eventually that became harder. And at one point, you know, he took medication and he was having trouble being roused. So his wife calls and they end up in the hospital. And when his dad wakes up, he goes, I'm really mad. I don't want to be in the hospital. Take me home. And the hospital saying, you're not safe to go home. Again, this health and safety we see. I need, you know, hospital saying, we need a safe discharge. We need a safe discharge. And he goes, I don't care. Get me out. I want to go home. Eventually, he prevailed and was able to go home and you know, stay with family. And he, um, the rest of the kids came, and they sat there for the next few days, and he slowly passed away. But everyone was at peace. And Dr. Gwande talks about how difficult it was, but how glad he was that his dad had that conversation because he was at peace because his dad had already made the choices. It wasn't him or his mom being forced to make the choices, being forced to say, is it time to let go? Is it not time to let go? Feeling guilt. Um, it was already decided because they had that tough conversation that no one wants to have. 
So in the book, he also talks about, which was clear and he acknowledged with hospice, that there's this misperception about hospice that the medical community often has and that society at large has. We believe that it's a giving up. And he talks about how it's not a giving up. In fact, his quote is perfect to explain it. He says, hospice is to help people with a fatal illness have the fullest possible lives right now. So again, we're talking about that shift in perceptions. It's not about necessarily health and safety, but we're talking or about finding every experimental treatment or every type of treatment, but we're talking about living in the present and doing what it what is that the patient wants and meeting their short-term and sometimes long-term goals, but doing what it is to have that quality of life we're all looking for, that autonomy that we want to have even at the end. And he talks, he ended up going on palliative care consults at his hospital. And he said, I don't know how you do this, I really wanna learn. And so he went and followed a palliative care team around who talked to various patients and would have those tough conversations, particularly when <coughs> the doctors were having a hard time palliative care team would come in and say, look what it is that you want to do. What are your short-term goals? What are your long-term goals? How can we get you there? And oftentimes he said it was, I want to be home. I don't want to be in the hospital. And the palliative care team would work with the physicians to accomplish treatment, but still get the person home or do whatever it is that they wanted, if they could, do, but also have those tough conversations saying, okay, it's not 10 to 20 years we're talking about for life expectancy anymore due to your chronic illness. We're talking six months to one year. So what is it that can we do that you want to do right now? And having those conversations about, okay, maybe you can't take that trip around the world, but we can have you go home and focus on seeing family and friends. So then he talks about how you know, we need to focus on this and how he started to provide palliative care consults, um, call them in for a lot of his patients, and to stop having that fix it for everything conversation with his patients, as he calls it. And he talks about then the role of the doctor and how the doctor's role needs to change. We shouldn't just rely on, he says, on the default setting of let's fix everything because I can keep tinkering until there's no more tinkering. And he gives this quote that the job of any doctor, one of his uh, consults told him, is to support quality of life by which he meant two things, as much freedom from the ravages of disease as possible and the retention of enough function for active engagement in the world. And he also says that you know, there's rarely nothing more that doctors can do. There's always something else out there. There's always one more fix or tinker or attempt or experimental drug or experimental treatment that we can try. And that we make no choice at all because we just choose to do the default and not have that tough discussion. So the book talks about how to have those tough discussions and what is it that we should do. So the tough discussions, he says, occur both in the medical setting, as we've just discussed, but also in the non-medical setting. Let's talk about what it is you know, as we age and how, how we can handle this. So going back to being in the non-medical setting, there's a story about actually Dr. Gwandi's wife's um, grandmother. She was living in her house. She was 80-something and independent, and she kept having falls, but it wouldn't tell anyone. And one day, she backs out of her driveway going, trying to go shopping, and she ends up backing all the way across the street into her neighbor's house. She didn't want to tell anyone. <laughs> she said, nope, didn't happen, like nothing happened. And then the next day, she ended up having people come to fix her house. You know, the roof needed fixing. And unfortunately, the roofers came at the end of the day and said, 
yeah, we told you it's $500, but you owe us 1000 and we're threatening until she paid. And then they came back the next day and extorted another $1,000 from her. And they tried to come back the next day, but luckily some neighbors stopped them. But she didn't tell the family because she was embarrassed and she wasn't ready to have that conversation. Eventually, her parent, her daughter found out and came over and said, oh, you know, I guess it's time that we need to have this discussion. You know, we're worried about you. And there's this whole tension again that, we have to, that uh, Dr. Gwandi talks about. The daughter wanted a safe place. The mom wanted independence and autonomy. And so there was this discussion again about what do we do with that? Uh, so Dr. Gwande talks about how it was tough for even his wife to you know, watch all of this and see her mother and her grandmother arguing over what was best with the health and safety and whether we should you know, go to that nursing home that provides the health and safety but doesn't have the independence that you know, she, the grandmother was still looking for. So he said, we need to, to figure something out. We need to have something else beside focusing on the health and safety. So he talks about a couple places around the United States have, that have tried this. So there's the Sanborn place in Oregon. And the idea was that they have apartments that provide people an opportunity to create a home-like setting able to lock their doors, which was really important to them, but also have assistance 24 hours a day available by you know, GPS tracking, um, call buttons put throughout the house, and the ability to um, have services come to them and transportation for when they needed to go to the doctor. And the founder of the Sanborn Place talks about how many obstacles she ran into. <laughs> The Department of Health in Oregon kept citing, oh, this isn't safe, this isn't safe, you know, and didn't want them to open this assisted living facility. The doctors and the hospital said, oh, we can't do a safe discharge back because you're living independently. And so she started forming relationships with certain hospitals that understood that the issue for the people living there was not necessarily health and safety as the primary motivation, but it was quality of life and well-being. That there was a different focus at the Sanborn place. Yes, you know, we still want health and safety and we want to take care, but our focus here is that, okay, yes, I will fall a couple times and I'm okay with that. I don't need to be in a wheelchair. I want to walk and I'm okay taking the risk of walking knowing that I could fall. And Dr. Gwande talks about how all of this is against societal norms. In all states, we have these states, we have these regulations, and we have inspections from the Department of Health, and we have um, legislatures passing laws, all focused on the health and safety, and not necessarily on the quality of life and the well-being, and admitting that it's OK for people to choose to keep walking even though they know that they're going to fall and potentially injure themselves. You know, the regulations don't want you to do that. And then we have state legislatures passing laws that enforce these, and we have lawsuits coming and saying, oh, you didn't take care of my mom because she fell. So there's this societal shift to push everyone toward this health and safety as the paramount concerns, whereas you know, sometimes people just want to be able to take that chance, take that chance to keep walking and have that autonomy, but knowing that they could fall and hurt themselves, and that's an OK chance for them to take. And he talks about how that is difficult and how as we as society, in some instances, want the health and safety. The kids of the parents going into assisted living and nursing homes want the health and safety as the paramount choice, but the parents going into these places, that's not necessarily their primary concern because they still want to be home and they want to be independent and they want to be autonomous and they want to be able to do things. They want to be able to sleep when they want to sleep. They want to be able to you know, walk around and take a chance for falling and how there's this fundamental tension between these two places that is taking place in society. 
So he talks about how we need to have these tough conversations to figure out how we can, again, meet whatever it is that the patient wants to have, whether it is okay to take that chance for falling, whether it's okay to not take that aggressive treatment, but that we need to focus on living life to the fullest and focusing on the well-being of that individual and confronting our mortality. I think the final thing he really talks about is the lack of discussion on advanced care planning. I talked about this a little bit, having those tough conversations that people don't want to have. So there's this study that he talks about where it's about cancer, and he says two-thirds of terminal cancer patients in this study reported having no discussion with their doctors about their goals for end-of-life care, despite being, on average, just four months from death. But the third who did have discussions were far less likely to undergo CPR or be put, up, put on a ventilator or end up in intensive care unit. Most of them enrolled in hospice, suffered less, were actually physically more capable, in addition, live for a longer period by choosing not to have as many aggressive treatments. And he said, people don't you know, think about this, that maybe having the choice to not intervene will actually let them do what they want to do and potentially let them live longer. And having that discussion about advanced care planning is tough. Part of that, and this isn't in the book, but it's an interesting statistic that we talk about a lot in ethics and discussing about this, is, is the perception as well of TV. So if you watch TV, if you watch the ER or any other medical show, you see people um, who get sick, have a heart attack, go get whisked away to the hospital, get CPR, and two thirds of them recover, miraculously, walk out of the hospital the next day like nothing ever happened. That's what you see on TV. And there's been a study done that shows that the survival rate on TV for CPR is 66%, okay? 66%. Actually, when you look at statistics in hospitals, all hospital patients, it's 15%. And we're talking everyone, all hospital patients, it's 15%. If you talk about uh, what they call in the study, frail elders, it's less than 5% that survive CPR. And then if you talk about individuals with an advanced chronic illness, so most of the patients that Dr. Gwande talks about in his book, it's less than 1% that survive CPR. 1%. Yet on TV, they're showing 66% of these people walk around and are whisked out of the hospital walking away the next day. I mean, let's talk about how society and our view of this is starkly different than what the actual facts are. It's amazing. When I first heard these statistics, I, I was blown away. Yeah, I knew it wasn't as high as TV, but less than 1% for chronic illness when TV's showing 66%? Not something that I knew. And I think it makes a big difference for these conversations about advanced care planning. You know, we don't want to have the conversations. We don't want to talk about our mortality. We don't want to talk about having a do not resuscitate order. We don't want to talk about not going to the hospital or not calling 911 at every instance, regardless of our health. We just, you know, we have this default setting. And that's what Dr. Gwande talks about. We have this default setting that we're just going to ignore it until crisis comes. And often when the crisis comes, the patient themselves don't have capacity to talk to us about what we want, what they wanted. So it's left to the family members to try to figure it out. I can't tell you how many times I saw this, unfortunately, in the hospital that we didn't have, the patient and the family didn't have those tough conversations. And then it fell to the family to try to figure out what, you know, mom or dad or brother or sister or whoever wanted, you know, after they were no longer able to talk to us and in the hospital. And the studies show that most people don't want to be spending the, life, the rest of their lives in a hospital. They don't want to die in a hospital. They don't want to be in the ICU. But all the studies show that 
When we don't have those conversations, that's where we end up, even though that's not where we want to be. It's because we don't have these conversations with our family, and it's a tough, it's a tough thing. You know, it, it's tough having those conversations, and it's not an easy topic that we want to talk about, regardless of our age. But it's something that I think this book strikes a chord, saying that we need to have these conversations, whether it's about our medical decision making, you know, whether you want to go to the hospital, what do you want? Do you want to eat chocolate ice cream? Is that the most important thing to you? Or is it, you know, being in the hospital? Uh, there's this great story in the book about uh, one of the palliative care physicians that he follows. And uh, the palliative care physician who has these conversations all the time with her patients, has these tough conversations with her patients all the time, uh, was forced to have it with her dad when her dad got sick. She flew out to California and, you know, he named her healthcare proxy. And then she was driving away from the hospital realizing that she didn't actually know what her dad wanted. So she turned around and went back and had that conversation that neither of them wanted to have. And she specifically asked, what's most important to you? His response? I want to be able to watch baseball, and I want to eat chocolate ice cream. <laughs> Apparently, he'd never watched a day of baseball in her life, in his life, that she could remember. <laughs> but that's what he wanted. He wanted to be able to watch baseball and eat chocolate ice cream. So when time came later, and you know she was faced with tough decisions, because he you know, had a medical mishap, she said that the best thing was she already knew what her dad wanted. He had already made the decision for her. She didn't even have to think about it. So she, in the middle of the surgery, the doctor comes out and says, you know, do you want me to continue with surgery or do you want me to stop? We, we ran into a roadblock, something's tough. And she goes, well, will he be able to eat chocolate ice cream if you continue? And the doctor says, yes, yes, he can eat chocolate ice cream if I continue. And she said, OK, then continue with the surgery. He wants to be able to eat chocolate ice cream. So it was having that tough conversation and figuring it out, what her dad wanted, that was able to make the decision for her when she had to. And she said, and Dr. Gwande talks about how that decision and that conversation was one of the most difficult conversations that his colleague had to have with her own dad, but that it was the conversation that made the decision and she knew that she was making the right decision. So she didn't have that guilt. She didn't have the guilt of knowing, of second guessing herself or trying to figure it out. So one of the biggest things that we see at the end of life in having these conversations is that we have a lack of information regarding our prognosis and diagnosis. The physicians don't feel equipped to be able to talk about it. They're not ready to talk about it. Again, that 530% overestimation that we don't want to talk about pain management. We don't want to talk about palliative care with this societal perception that there is this giving up when that's not what palliative care is about. Um, and Dr. Gwandi talks about how we need to overcome these things, and we need to have this conversation about what it is that we want to have. So in New York, um, we're trying to get there, I guess. We're, we have the Palliative Care Information Act that was passed a couple years ago that requires doctors and nurse practitioners to provide information and counseling uh, when they estimate that their patient has less than six months to live. Then there was a Palliative Care Access Act passed that extends the obligations to all sorts of facilities, hospitals, nursing homes, home care, assisted living facilities, that requires uh, all of them to provide access to and facilitate access to palliative care. This belief that we need to work on this. And Dr. Gwande talks about how we all of us need to work on recognizing palliative care and how legislatures need to move forward on this and focus on having this option and talking about not necessarily let's fix everything, but what is meaningful to the person? What is this quality of life that they want? 
and what can we do for that? Um, and having that discussion about advanced care planning and having the discussion about who's going to make decisions for you when you're not able to make decisions, so appointing a health care proxy, uh, are all important steps in recognizing and respecting the autonomy of the person and shifting our societal perspectives on do everything even when that is detrimental to the person. His quote, I think, just to end, about autonomy. He defines autonomy as that this is what it means to have autonomy. You may not control life circumstances, but getting to be the author of your life means getting to control what you do with it. And so focusing on that and what we do, you know, both in having those tough conversations so that we can live out the way we want to and enabling well-being throughout both in non-medical and medical settings. So I'm open for questions about the book. <laughs> yes? Uh, you said the, that legislation requires physicians to be uh, aware of palliative care. Yes. But are there palliative care teams at any of our institutions, hospital, nursing home, uh, Yes. We do. So Albany Med and St. Peter's both have um, palliative care teams. They're expanding. Um, there's been a big push for both of them, and I know that they've expanded their services in both hospitals. Um, and I believe that they're also available in some of the home care settings, or at least there's a doctor who can come. Um, all of the home care settings and nursing homes have somebody who they can contact to have that discussion with. In the back. Suppose I'm in some situation, could be hospital, home. How do I keep from getting declared incompetent to make my decision? What legal tools do I have? And if I have that settled, I make decisions, what legal tools do I have to enforce my decisions and not have it taken away from me? Absolutely. Um, it's a great question as well. Uh, there's a couple things you can do. There's a document called a living will. So a living will is not uh, legally binding in New York. It is in some other states. But you can set out all your preferences and your wishes and your beliefs and whatever else you want to put, things that are important to you. Um, so that's a really good document. And, and then give it to your primary care physician, have it at your home, tell your friends about it, you know, making it known what you have. Uh, the other important document is if you are to lose capacity, uh, which sometimes happens, uh, appointing a health care agent who will carry out your wishes. So the standard in New York uh, is that if you appoint a health care agent, they have to follow your known wishes or what's in your best interest. So if you have talked with them and had the conversation uh, and have a list of things, then they have to carry out. And it's particularly good if it's written down because then if you have a living will and you have a health care agent, they'll be more likely to follow some of your wishes. So you can pick someone you trust to carry out your wishes, and then you have a living will so that if the wish is already, if you've already decided something, they don't even have to, to make that decision. You've already decided when you had capacity, and the doctors have to follow that decision. So those are both um, two important tools. And then the last one would be, I think, uh, it's a document called the MOLST. It's the Medical Orders on Life-Sustaining Treatment. Uh, New York loves the acronyms, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, and so the most is available. It's actually a medical order, but it's available to individuals in the last year of their life. So if you have a chronic illness or another de um, debilitating type disease, you can talk to your physician and you can enter a most order in certain circumstances. And the most um, is a bright pink form. It has to be bright pink. I'm talking neon pink, so you can't miss it. Uh, and it talks about um, your desires about CPR as well as about intubation. 
about artificial hydration and nutrition, antibiotics, whether you want to be taken to the hospital, not taken to the hospital. And it also has um, trial periods for everything. And it's a document uh, that everyone recognizes, so you can put it on your fridge and uh, give a copy to your doctor. And then EMS is trained that even if your family member calls, they'll look for the most. And if it's there, they'll check on that before um, doing anything. So even if your family's not ready to accept that maybe you don't want to go to the hospital or you don't want CPR, if you have a MOLST form, um, you'll be able to declare your wishes. And that is followed by everyone, whether it's paramedics, EMS, or the hospital. It's a little yeah. bit different. Uh, New York passed in 2010 the Family Health Care Decisions Act, which was passed uh, to help the situation where you have an appointed health care agent. Um, it's a statutory, uh, there's a statutory list of individuals who can make decisions for you. So the attending physician gets, goes down the list of who's available uh, if you lack capacity and don't have a health care agent. But there are limitations under that law. So you can't, um, they can't withdraw artificial hydration or nutrition unless certain circumstances are met. There's also um, more procedural safeguards for withdrawing or um, withholding life-sustaining treatment just because there wasn't that per already determined person to make decisions. Uh, but it does allow for, um, it does address the need when person, a person doesn't have a healthcare agent and something happens and they lack capacity. There is a statutory way for someone in your family uh, to make decisions for you. Yes. You said the healthcare agent, mm -hmm. is, assuming that you've got a proxy and it's made out, the healthcare agent's following that. They are to follow the proxy, your wishes, or what's in your best interest. But that may be different because we understand that the industry today, the best interest is to keep you alive as long as possible, keep you in the hospital as long as possible, extend death. They'll decide your best interests may be different than what you want in your healthcare proxy. Isn't there a dichotomy there in what the healthcare agent is supposed to be doing? So they have to follow your wishes. So as long as you have your wishes known and you've had that conversation, they have to follow that. So if you haven't had a conversation and then a situation arises that you didn't talk about, you don't have a wish, then they have to follow best interest. But best interest isn't um, what's based on societal norms. It has a different definition. So the definition is based upon like your preferences, religious beliefs, social beliefs, whatever they are, um, they inform the decision making for your best interest on you individually. So it's not a best interest of society at whole, it's the best interest of that individual person based upon what is known about them. So there are some protections. You mentioned perceptions. In the media, of course, everybody over 55 or 60 is a blithering idiot, so that's, that's <laughs> part of it. But beyond that, is there any discussion among the healthcare industry about the perception of patients who are over 55 or 60 or 65 or 70 who are just assumed to be incapable of making difficult decisions, although we've been making them all our lives? <laughs> yes, um, I think that is something that's being talked about, and I, I think that's one of the best things about this book uh, is that you know, there's this perception in that we're trying to challenge. It's the whole discussion about living autonomously, regardless of your age, and making those decisions that may seem contrary to the health and safety, but that you're still capable of making decisions and focusing on those decisions. That falls exactly contrary to not letting you out of the hospital unless you have a safe place to go. Right. So I don't think our laws have caught up necessarily. Um, you have to have a, a sign off legally so that you're not going to sue whatever place that you're, you know, that, that you're staying at. Right. Have this independence. Right. <laughs> so then you have a note in your chart about um, leaving against medical advice, um, which is a whole other topic. But I don't think our laws have quite caught up to uh, where Dr. Gwande wants them to be or this focus on maybe quality of life instead of health and safety. Um, because we're, we're always focused on the safe discharge and you have to take your medications and if you're not going to, are you sure they have capacity and documenting everything and uh, it becomes you know, a lot of paperwork instead of focusing on, yes, we can still make decisions regardless you know, and uh, walking that fine line. Thanks everyone.